Welcome everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, kind of my journey the past few years, reverse engineering Xbox Live. Um, it was sort of my COVID project, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, so I'm Tristan. I also go as uh, Mono Casa on the internet when I have hot takes of questionable veracity. So that's what I'm using today. Um, so yeah, uh, today we're going to be going, I'm going to kind of go over a background. Uh, we're going to go kind of deep into what the protocols are themselves a bit. Um, we're going to look at kind of how I took a look at uh, reverse engineering it. Um, kind of if somebody wanted to repeat this work, uh, you know, what, what, what you'd have to do to do that. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about a little bit about the replacement server architecture I've built up so far, um, where it's going. Uh, what exists at the moment. Um, and then I'm kind of going to go into a brain dump of discussing, uh, you know, as I've gone through this and I, I have very strong feelings about how to support people in a very, how to put this, what, what's the ethical way to support abandoned software in an increasingly networked world? Um, and then uh, we're going to go into questions. Um, unfortunately, the demo gods weren't with us today. Uh, my Xbox actually got the click of death literally last night. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll put up a video uh, tonight. Um, but source is up too, so you can go take a look at that. So, starting off, uh, who am I? I'm uh, Monokasa, Tristan. Um, I'm an engineer. I've got a, a lot of experience. I've got uh, with binary reversing, firmware development, cloud-based device and identity management, and uh, experience with custom tunneling of IP. So these are all sort of a perfect storm for taking a look at Xbox Live, taking it apart. Um, those are sort of the skill sets you would need to take a look at other video game networks. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, I'm monokasa at zombie.org. Uh, so zombie's the name of my particular replacement Xbox Live infrastructure. Um, it was live, then it died for original Xboxes, and now it's back again. I thought it was a cute play of words. Um, before we get much farther, uh, I wanted to just kind of give a shout out to the uh, other people kind of working in the same space. Um, there's M. Borgeson, who uh, has put in a ton of work into the emulators for Xbox, uh, called Zemu, XEMU. Uh, there's also a guy by the name of Luke Usher, who's working on similar replacement server architecture called uh, Insignia for Xbox Live. Uh, I think they both have Patreons. I'm sure they both would love some support. I've got nothing but love for both those people. Um, and interestingly, for a talk about 2000, you know, early 2000s era Microsoft code, like I am going to rag on them a little bit, but um, I was actually kind of surprised looking back on this with a uh, sort of historical context with all of the, ob mo or at least most of the obvious flaws, Microsoft, it, it, it actually makes sense in context. Um, and there's actually a pretty good protocol set. And from what I tell, can tell, other than, you know, it's, it's 20 years old, but other than upgrading the crypto primitives, a lot, a lot of the basics are still here and a lot of the structure is still here and a lot of it still continues to make sense. So, um, yeah. So, like I've talked, we're uh, talking about Xbox Live today. Um, my focus has really been on for the original console. Um, that's the only system that Microsoft so far has shut down access for. Uh, so that was from new November 2002 until April 2010. Um, there were some people that managed to keep their in-game sessions going for like a month later, which was really interesting. Because um, ultimately, as kind of we'll see, a lot of Xbox Live is ultimately the signaling pathway, and then they generate, um, once you have like an in-game session, that's, for most games, doesn't actually communicate that much with the back end. 
Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of like WebRTC in that regard uh, for a more modern context. Um, I'm also kind of trying to stay away from systems that are still online and kind of give Microsoft some space to <laughs> where, where they're still making their money. Um, there's been, you know, in, in the Xbox hacking scene, there was uh, some people who didn't quite live by that same standard, and I don't think anybody won that game. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, kind of going back, um, Xbox Live was really kind of the first modern video game network in a lot of ways. There's a lot of other ones before it. Um, you know, it, it obviously took a lot of in inspiration from SegaNet. Um, even it, but, I mean, video game networks actually go really far back. Uh, there was this really cool network called X-Band in the mid-90s that was like a um, Game Genie and like a modem stuck on it. And then they would like ROM hack uh, more or less in real time to add online multiplayer to like SNES cartridges. Um, and then this was like a commercial product that I didn't even hear, hear of at the time. Uh, super cool. Um, but like I said, Xbox Live is sort of the first modern video game console network. Um, and by that we mean there's a cohesive service sort of across the games. Um, otherwise, these, previously these networks have sort of been, will provide network services, but otherwise, you know, each game is sort of a island onto itself. Um, at release, it sort of expected broadband to exist. Um, they did try to sort of support modems, it looked like, in development. Um, but they didn't actually release with that, and so it kind of set a standard of uh, bandwidth of, you know, you essentially have to have been able to stream a simple Netflix, which is an, a, a nice, very, a very nice baseline for uh, these sorts of services we expect out of modern systems. Um, the Xbox uh, shipped with a hard drive on the console, which was one of the, I might have been the first to ship with a hard drive, um, was definitely the first to like expect that kind of large amount of storage. Um, that gives you enough local storage to be able to like update games, make sure everybody's consistent. Uh, it brought up DLC, which is, you know, I've got mixed feelings about, um, but, you know, it can be used for good and can be used for bad. Um, it, it was actually moderated for one of the first times, um, so you can attempt to have a, a pleasant experience sort of d despite the other people you're playing with. Um, so th these are all sort of new features and th these are all sort of table stakes now for a video game network. So it's really interesting to, at least in my mind, take a look at the first stab of how these got created. Um, so we're going to jump right in. Uh, the base protocols it uses, um, it's all IPv4. Um, so if anyone has a slash 24 they want to give me for free, I'd appreciate that, but <laughs> probably not going to happen. Um, uh, uses DNS then to actually um, bootstrap up to the different services. Uh, ends up using Kerberos uh, to um, work as sort of the uh, auth Z and auth N component, uh, which is kind of actually really core to the security infrastructure. Um, and then there's always been this uh, mysterious UDP port 3074, which is a uh, custom VPN protocol. Um, and that's really the core of, of honestly all Xbox networking, um, including system link, but uh, is also the core of how boxes communicate to Xbox Live and each other. Um, is this VPN that uses the uh, cryptographic attestations of identity from the Kerberos uh, to connect and communicate with each other. So crypto primitives, this is where um, that historical context kind of comes in. This is a great who's who of, uh, pro of crypto primitives you really shouldn't really use anymore. Um, 
MD5 SHA-1 for hashing, RC4 for uh, symmetric encryption, and DES and 3DES for symmetric, symmetric encryption on the VPN. Um, yeah, you shouldn't use any of these anymore. Uh, Microsoft agrees with you. That's probably why Xbox, original Xboxes aren't allowed on live anymore. That combined with, um, there, there were some of the other constraints and the Xboxes themselves, um, the, the, all these Xbox Live libraries are statically compiled into each game on original Xbox. That's so something they fixed in the 360, but they would have to go back and update, release updates for literally every original Xbox title to allow it. Um, so that, that, that sort of explains why they ended up cutting them off, but still allow 360s, which are pretty old. Uh, so DNS, um, we actually only hit three different DNS targets. Uh, there's Max, which we'll get into. Um, AS and TG TGS are fairly standard uh, Kerberos servers. And then um, SG012N is uh, the security gateway. That is the VPN itself. Um, and then all other communications go through that VPN other than talking to other boxes. Um, there's also, if you get into the binary reversing, you'll see hints of um, PartnerNet, which is Microsoft's private instances of all this stuff used for testing. So it'll be as.part.xboxlive. Um, if you see that, that's, that's what that stuff is. Um, that's Microsoft, they can have that. I don't want to touch that or piss them off, so. <laughs> Sweet. So um, once you, you know, are up and talking to these servers, uh, like we said, we're using Kerberos for um, off Z, off N. Uh, it's, if you've played with OAuth, it's very similar ideas from a very 1980s perspective. Um, we use, it uses this thing called ASN.1, ASN uh, specifically the DER version instead of um, JSON and for their communications and particularly they use tickets instead of jots or tickets instead of tokens. Um, ASN1 is this, it's actually really interesting, it's this sort of, um, if Protobuf had a ton of different possible encodings uh, where, so DER is sort of a fairly byte packed encoding that kind of makes sense. Um, you'll also see that too in like exit 509 tickets are DER encoded. Um, if you care about every bit, there's a uh, PEM encoding if you care about, um, but there's also like a JSON encoding, there's an XML encoding. It's, it's really from the 80s and has picked up a, a new encoding every time somebody cared. Um, it's also sort of a, been a thorn in the side of security, uh, you know, particularly like blue team kind of people. Um, I, I guess uh, been really nice for red, time, red team kind of people. Um, it's an extremely complex spec, um, and a lot of our encoding for security purposes these days sort of takes ASN1 in context and tries to not be that and tries to be a lot simpler because pretty much until the advent of memory safe languages, there weren't safe ASN1 parsers. AS, it, up through the 90s, up through the early 2000s, ASN1 was really easy to find buffer overflows in for a very long time. Um, so that's why we don't use it anymore. Uh, but um, this is, you know, the sort of uh, was what you used at the time. Uh, super interestingly, it doesn't use, even though it's auth C, auth N, it doesn't use um, public private crypto. There's no, you know, signed by a private key that could be validated by a public search. Um, all, although that was technically added 
as a extension to the RFC. I think it came out in the, the, the newer RFC that's an option. But that's not like the core of how it works. And it's all about um, pre-shared keys and have, having a key here and having a key here means I can e encrypt in HMAC different pieces and then I can use that to then negotiate sort of the next key of the process in private. Um, th this is all ultimately the underlying piece of how um, Windows domain logins work. So your pre-shared key in that case is your, uh, your actual like password you type in. On the Xbox, it ends up being uh, keys that sort of were um, pre-added to the console at manufacturing time. Um, and so it ends up sitting on, uh, there's an EEPROM on every console that has all sorts of manufacturing time information. And there's a little online key. Um, it's a heavily extensible protocol as well. So there's these kind of arbitrary dumping ground of pre-auth data fields. Um, Microsoft ends up using these very, very heavily. Um, so we, we sort of skipped over Max originally, uh, which is the machine account creation service. Uh, but Max um, uses Kerberos, but arguably to the point of not even being Kerberos anymore and is just using those pre-auth data fields to communicate not tokens, but um, other information that we'll sort of get to right now. Um, so yeah, so Max is the machine account creation service. Um, so original Xboxes, I, I haven't quite figured out why this is the case. Um, they, they have a key available in the EEPROM that was, that was put there at manufacturing time then an Xbox will use the Kerberos to convert uh, that secret on the EEPROM into a full account for the box itself. And then, however, that account, that key, has exactly the same key length uh, that was negotiated. So it, it turns a 16-byte key into another 16-byte key for reasons I'm not totally clear with, uh, clear about. Uh, maybe they were still figuring out how uh, the Xbox, um, maybe they were still figuring out live and they just wanted to get all those pieces together at, you know, so that when they release live later, they'd have something. Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, but move on. Uh, so it, it ends up using just standard Kerberos AS Rex, AS Reps to uh, verify that shared secret, create an account, and then from then on the uh, machine uses that account to um, present itself to uh, the security gateway. Uh, so like we were saying, there's a bunch of uh, extra pre-auths. Um, there's a client version that you sign with secrets, which basically tells you what, uh, what executable is being used here. Um, so it ends up, a lot of times ends up looking like um, if it's just the machine itself and just trying to bootstrap this thing, it ends up looking like the, uh, uh, the Xbox's dashboard. Um, you've got this, thing that they call the pre pre auth that I don't really understand. Um, it's just hashes the console serial and secrets in an interesting way. Uh, the only thing that makes any sense to me is it helps some lookup that they have, um, but it's not really necessary and doesn't really add anything to from, from a security perspective that I can see. Um, then uh, there's this 131 that's a constraint on user data in a way that's sort of meaningless. Um, it's a MS Kyle thing, which is another extension to Kerberos. And uh, then the current timestamp. And otherwise, it sort of looks like a normal AS request. Um, 
then the max service comes back to the console. It gives it a ticket. So like we said, it's sort of like an OAuth token that doesn't make sense and gets thrown away. Um, in my case, I set the expiration to Unix Epoch just to make sure that it can't be used anything for anything. Um, and then it gives it a uh, account creation pre-auth, which contains the whole machine user identity. Um, and the box then ends up storing all this on this unpartitioned space on the hard drive. Um, I haven't really figured out why. So there's this, I want to say like a half meg space on the hard drive that isn't in any partition. Um, and I haven't really been able to figure out why information gets stored there. The, the best theory I have is that um, the underlying storage there was originally supposed to be on a flash and they migrated it because they didn't have an extra flash or didn't want to touch the flash or something. Um, but it, it's not really hiding that much because it's very clear from the binary what's happening because it's the only thing that's opening the raw uh, partition pretty much on the system. Um, so it's not really even a good obfuscation technique. Um, I mean, maybe if you were looking at it, but they're already using weird partitions and weird partitioning schemes. So it is any, so you, you, I don't know. It, it never really made sense, but it's, that's where it is. Um, that's what that partition space is. Uh, ultimately, all of that unpartitioned space is cached information. Um, so anybody who is super concerned about uh, preservation uh, of that unpartitioned space and like afraid that you know if they modded their console and dumped and uh, never restored that piece, um, you can still get on live. All that information isn't there, isn't necessary to get on live re-implementations, um, which is good news. Uh, a lot of people were very scared that uh, they had written their way out of being able to be on live. Um, so users, users is a really interesting concept in Xbox Live and this is probably one of the cooler things that made me want to talk uh, in front of DEF CON. Um, so, so a user on Xbox Live is a very broad concept. Um, the machine itself is a user in addition to what you would think of as, you know, people sitting there with controllers in their hands in each controller port. So the, you, you, it's a really interesting take of um, kind of one of the first stabs of like IoT security and this idea of the machine itself being given a full identity rather than um, like for a lot of auth Z auth N systems, you see what device they're on end up being like metadata for the user as opposed to combined in like, like a user in its own sense and then smearing users together into a combined authorization. Uh, so, yeah, so boxes have their own ID, their own full, uh, they have their own gamer tags. It ends up being like SN dot serial number. Um, ends up being a, uh, I ended up sticking them in a different Kerberos realm, but I haven't dug, I haven't been able to find an original uh, machine account, so I don't know what Microsoft originally does. Um, just like regular users, machine users, they both have a 16 byte shared secret. That's the ultimately the um, bootstrapping of Kerberos. They have uh, domains and realms, which are just basically namespaces. Um, so you can think, you know, at blah, 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 dot com, at blah, 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 dot net. Um, everyone's got a uh, XUID, which is a 64 bit user ID. Um, Everything on original Xbox seems to be start with 0009 for some reason. I don't know why that is, but um, the boxes don't seem to care. Uh, and then non machine users um, will have uh, flags and a passcode. Um, so there's this flags, if you ever, th there has two different concepts. One is um, 
for guest accounts, if you ever wondered how that worked, you have the same XUID as your host user. You just have uh, different bits in, in the flags that say I'm a guest account of this user. Um, then the rest of the flags are things like I was a shithead and therefore I am completely banned from speaking on everything uh, globally. Um, and those sort of cross uh, communications uh, black marks on the user are sort of put in there. Um, and then also in the uh, user account, they've got the passcode, which is a pretty simple keeping your little brother from getting on your account. Um, so it'll just be, you know, AA, BB, up, down, or something. Cool. So that brings us to um, the actual authorization flow at this point. Uh, at this point, your Xbox is signed into Max, it's gotten a full account, uh, then it moves into, uh, you know, actually trying to connect. And so um, this is a pretty standard Kerberos flow for the most part. Um, we end up creating a ticket granting ticket that gives you a um, cryptographic proof of identity of the pre-shared key and gives you a ticket that you can pre present to the next uh, piece. It's sort of like an OAuth bearer token. It lets you, it, it, it essentially lets you it, prove that you are who you think you are to other, um, other entities. Uh, it can be a very multi-step process. So this is, this is sort of kind of what I was getting at where it, it'll first build up a ticket grinning ticket with the the machine's account, and then it does this um, combined identity thing where it starts layering all of the other users on top of it and, and sort of smears all of the identities together into this one um, cryptographic version of identity, uh, which is a really interesting concept and one I haven't seen used very much uh, these days. Um, cool. So from there, we uh, talk to TGS, which is the ticket granting service. So you give it a ticket granting ticket. It gives you back a service ticket. Um, pretty simple. So th th this will be a little bit um, shorter uh, time frames. This will also, you'll tell it that you want um, certain backend services and it'll give you a ticket for those backend services for those users. So at the end of the day, um, this is sort of another really interesting part and probably one of the cooler parts of Xbox Live is um, even before you're fully connected, you have this cryptographic attestation of identity that is combined with which backend services you can talk to. Uh, that's sort of the mid-level of their backend system, um, which is really, really neat. Uh, it sort of reminds me of how Facebook um, has added to their TLS connections on their backend. The, th they really try to tag the identity of the user that was the cause of the request to everything so that they can really track it through their systems very well. Um, this could give you the same way to do that kind of information, to, to, to track user identities through requests, to um, restrict users on a per game basis, per, uh, per user basis, um, and kind of handle it all very holistically, all underneath the individual game protocols and what, what all the other protocols are kind of what they expect. Um, so, you know, it kind of brings it back to our other pre auths. Uh, they've got 201, 202. So we have a um, service request, which is basically the game saying, hey, I, I want to talk to matchmaking, I want to talk to stats. And then uh, the service address, um, you'll get. Uh, a address of which um, security gateway you can talk to and which uh, underlying ports uh, to talk to um, for both for the security gateway, well, so the security gateway is going to be on 3074, but uh, also for the 
once you've connected in through the VPN, which ports you can talk to and which services they're kind of connected to. It's almost it, it has very almost SDN kind of underlying components, which for something that was created in 2002 is kind of nutty to me. Um, so brings us to the security gateway. That's on uh, that's that port 3074. Um, this is a custom VPN. Uh, it really looks like IPsec. Um, also, really looks like WireGuard, which looks like IPsec a lot. Um, it signs and encrypts pretty much all traffic. It sits at layer two. Um, it smears TCP and UDP sort of into itself in a way uh, that you also kind of see in IPsec to a degree. Um, it's very, 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 very focused on saving bytes wherever it can. Um, I, I think some of that probably relates to trying to get this thing running on modems originally, like it seemed like they were doing, because um, they, they go to absolutely heroic uh, ways to save a byte here, save a byte there. Um, yeah. Cool. Here, here's the uh, underlying packet format. Um, so you have. Uh, First byte contains padding and an opcode. Uh, the padding tells you, um, so the encryption for the actual payload ends up being, uh, how about this? Uh, the padding for the actual payload ends up being eight byte aligned because that's the uh, block cipher size. So the padding tells you how much of the payload, uh, how much of the block cipher goes past the payload. Um, you've got an opcode, so zero ends up being control packets. Uh, then you've got three each for TCP, UDP, and another protocol called VDP. Um, you've got three bytes for a spy. Uh, that is a security parameters index. That's essentially a session identifier. Um, you've got payload, uh, which when we talked about, that can just kind of be anything. Um, so that'll be. For things like TCP, that'll be the actual fragment data. It won't be the headers or that kind of information. Um, for uh, the control packets, it'll be just kind of arbitrary data. Uh, Diffie-Hellman, it'll be uh, you know all, all those sort of uh, pieces that need to be negotiated. Um, pr pretty arbitrary amounts of data. Uh, for TCP, UDP, and VDP, you have um, like a footer, which contains what would normally be their header information. Um, and a really cool, but one of those ways Microsoft is going to heroic ways to save bytes, if there's padding, the so the protocol footer doesn't need to be encrypted. It'll be signed. But if there's padding, it can be stored up, it, it can basically be optionally encrypted if that helps you save bytes um, because the encryption step will happen uh, before trying to parse the protocol footer. Um, we'll have two bytes of sequence number, then there's also sequence number, there's also an additional two hidden bytes of sequence number where you just have to understand um, you just have to remember where you were. You start at zero. Once it rolls over, each side will bump up their, their higher bytes, but they don't actually communicate that. Um, that. I think that's also true of IPsec, though. That's not like a super crazy thing. Um, then there's also a signature, which is uh, 10 bytes of a truncated SHA-1 of everything, including the hidden sequence bytes uh, with keys that were negotiated at the same time as the Diffie-Hellman. Um, so one thing I am going to rag on a little bit is the way the signature check is computed here. It ends up being you you do it over the protocol footer, then the header, then the refs of the payload, then the sequence number or something so, something like that. It it pulls them all out, which means that you have to do a significant amount of processing of this packet 
to understand where the boundaries of these different pieces are before you validated the signature. Um, if, I mean, don't roll your own crypto is kind of rule one and two and three and five, but if we're at rule six and you are implementing your own crypto, just keep it simple and sign everything in a linear way. Don't, don't force somebody to, um, to interpret something before they've been able to verify the signature on it. Um, it looks like Microsoft did it right. Um, I, I didn't find any bugs in it. It's just hard to get right. And I wouldn't trust myself to get it right, basically. <laughs> cool. Um, so yeah, we've got the uh, control packets. Um, so it's opcode zero, uh, a lot of Diffie-Hellman uh, parameter negotiation. Um, if you're shutting down the VPN to talk to it, there's a piece for that. There's um, kind of keep alives that keep the connection going and the service will uh, kill it off if it doesn't see keep alives in a while. There's also, um, interestingly, there's this uh, event queue too that sits at this, at this protocol layer where um, a lot of server side events happen sort of at this layer two sitting underneath uh, the TCP and all that where, so if you've ever seen, uh, you know, your friend wants to invite you to a game or um, they started playing another thing and it sort of pushes an event to your console and, it, you know, it makes a little pop up. It ends up, ha the, that ends up, that event ends up getting pushed down at that layer two, which is really interesting to me. There isn't like a equivalent of like a WebSocket or something that they have. I mean, obviously they didn't have WebSockets in 2002, but th there isn't some higher level protocol that's being kept together, um, but it's uh, all sort of negotiated at this low level that these events are taking place, um, which is really interesting. Uh, there's also a bunch of throttling and um, QoS management that happens uh, in negotiating at this layer. Um, the other opcodes, um, we have UDP and TCP, but they remove a bunch of stuff. Um, if every packet is signed, then you don't need checksums. Um, I think they removed the urgent bit out of the T out of their TCP stack, which is awesome. Uh, urgent's awful. I, I wish everybody could remove urgent. Um, each of these has th actually three opcodes because um, they do a cute scheme where if you're port uh, 1024, then you have, uh, you don't actually have to list the ports. If you're within like 127 of that port, then you can list the ports as just single byte offsets. Um, but if you're one of the other ports, you do uh, normal two byte ports like you'd expect. Um, there's also VDP, which I've kind of hinted at. And so that's UDP, but with a uh, part of the payload that is outside of the encrypted segment. And that's where it stores voice. Um, which means that voice in Xbox Live is unencrypted in the air. And that is ostensibly for lawful intercept. So that, um, you know, the, the cops can get a wire and trace you and look at everything you're saying. Um, so that, that is what that is. Uh, don't uh, plan a uh, insurrection over Xbox Live, I guess is, is the point there. Um, cool. And then at that point, you have a full um, connection into the VPN. You have a cryptographic attestation to your identity. You have that identity also contains um, which services on the back end you're allowed to talk to. Um, there's about 20 of them, at least on the original. I haven't checked in recently. Uh, there's this one called presence that always gets used. Um, that essentially, that's where you end up pushing your event that you are in a game. Um, and it, it ends up kind of being a dumping ground for a lot of, uh, pieces of the ancillary pieces of Xbox Live as well. Um, 
games can have custom services. So if you think like uh, a cl classic ones are MMOs, uh, will have uh, custom services for their backends. So they'll just negotiate a different one and they'll connect through there. Even if you're an MMO and you're running your own servers, all of these communications still end up initially hitting this VPN. Um, everything is kind of encrypted through and through um, and is this one protocol stack. Um, unfortunately, as I've been uh, re-implementing this stuff, um, I, I played a lot of Halo 2 as a teenager. I, I kind of joke that I am doing this so that when I hit my midlife crisis, I have what I want to do when I was a teenager as well. Um, but <laughs> uh, Halo 2 uses a custom service as well, so it, it doesn't come for free. Uh, but we'll have to, uh, I'm sure we'll get there. Um, these backend services uh, actually tend to be HTTP. Um, they tend to be with custom binary pro, uh, payloads kind of on a per service basis. But um, I, I wasn't really expecting something as forward looking. Um, really, really strong inclinations that they're primarily written in um, C sharp ASP.NET servers. There's a lot of like .ashx endpoints, which in context would have been like a beta version of ASP.NET, I think, um, which is uh, kind of really, really, really forward looking for what, at least in my mind, for what, uh, you know, how to release uh, internet connected service for, you know, 2002 um, and really have, you know, once you have TCP up to just kind of treat everything as HTTP for uh, 2002 era was uh, quite forward looking. Um, so kind of going through it, uh, presence, like we said, or always exists. Um, that's where client push events come from. So like we said, there is that uh, event queue where for server pushed events, this is where the client push events for the most part end up coming from. Uh, matchmaking, this is a matchmaking service that will, for games that aren't ranked for the most part, uh, but you're just trying to find somebody close to you, somebody, you know, maybe somebody close to your GOIP or somebody with, uh, you know, uh, low ping for whatever reason, uh, ends up going through matchmaking service. Um, there's a strings service that I think does internationalization and maybe sanitization for, for moderation so they can update these are the words you're not allowed to say and query. Um, there's feedback, which is uh, this guy called me a slur. Um, so like moderation requests end up going through there. Um, stats, there's uh, leaderboards uh, go through there. You also, um, the, so I, I, I figured out a couple more of these uh, since I wrote up these slides. That also goes, uh, so for ranked matches, uh, that's where it ends up building up your ELO and or whatever algorithm um, is off of the stats information. There's also a arbitration service that looks like a lot like matchmaking, but it ends up generating sessions for ranked play. Um, messaging, uh, you can send users messages, pretty clear. Uh, auto update, um, this is, you know, one of those key pieces that was, like I said, kind of newer to Xbox Live because they had the storage on each console necessary to do this, making sure that everybody's playing the same version of the game. Um, and then there's, you know, team management as a team service. Um, let's see. Oh, and there's also a uh, NAT detection service that'll let you do, um, you know, NAT punching and at least NAT understanding. Uh, a lot of the, the NAT stuff is actually interesting because by sticking everything on that per, port 3074, uh, you get a, a lot of NAT punching sort of for free because you've already communicated to uh, the external services and so therefore any incoming game request can also come in on that port because you've already done 80% of NAT punching. Um, so it's kind of a nice way to do that. 
Sweet. So um, then we have a uh, match, uh, or just joining a game session. What does that look like? So um, you end up using the matchmaking service uh, to query for or sort of create a session. Um, that session information ends up containing a host and uh, a lot of the like random parameters of like what a game will contain. Um, so there'll be a session identifier. There'll be a uh, key exchange key, which lets boxes talk to each other without Diffie helming to each other. Um, once a box gets a list of potential hosts to join a game in, uh, they end up logging into that host with more or less the same VPN protocol. So this, that VPN is ultimately the kind of base layer of even that piece um, and uh, system link as well. Uh, yeah, and we already covered net punching. Um, system link. Uh, yeah, so system link's about the same. Uh, you'll, they'll throw out a uh, broadcast packet encrypted with essentially the same key, um, but will uh, uh, so it'll be a, like a per game key that's on the the disk, um, so that they can see each other's uh, game announcements, and then the ultimately the host box will set up a VPN server, and the other boxes will VPN into it, and that's how System Link ends up working. Um, and it looks like actually games don't have a TCP stack other than based on this t this. Uh, uh, VPN protocol, so they couldn't even do anything if they wanted to. Um, cool. Uh, how do you go about reversing this stuff? A um, lot of staring at Ghidra. Uh, there's a really, uh, I want to give a shout out to whatever contractor had to add Xbox executable support to Ghidra. Um, it probably didn't need to happen at that point anymore, and he probably was wondering what he was doing with his life. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate it. It's probably one of the best uses of my defense dollars. Um, going looking at it, uh, <laughs> Gauntlet Dark Legacy ships with uh, a PDB just on the disk. Um, it doesn't have the uh, online capabilities, but you can kind of get your bearings about like what an Xbox game looks like. Uh, Red Star um, is an online game that ships with the full symbol map, including the online uh, shared libraries. Um, Jedi Knight Jedi Academy is uh, GPL'd, um, their Xbox version, and that includes uh, all of the online components, uh, not the Microsoft code directly, but how to call it. Um, and then in every executable, XOnline and XNet is broken out uh, into separate sections. Uh, XOnline is the online component XNet is what you just need for a system link uh, and contains the, the VPN stack essentially. All crypto is cleanly exported by the kernel, so you can see that on the import list. Um, you can go here, github.com slash zombie online slash zombie is a GPL source for re-implementation, uh, very proof of concept. Uh, PRs are welcome. Zombie.org, whenever I end up updating DNS entries will be where you go to sign up for an alpha. Uh, to get added back online. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of want to move the industry towards um, a theory of software security harm reduction when it comes to network services where, um, and, and so kind of where I'm at there is people are going to use software now online that they can't update anymore, which is, I mean, you know, rule one is don't do that, but people are going to do that. Um, so I, I've got, I'm open sourcing a lot of this stuff to um, really start thinking about how we can protect people even in these very unsafe conditions and very, like, start opening things up and, shine, you know, doing so by shining a light and sort of adding knowledge. Um, and uh, I don't think we have time for the demo as given, and I don't think it's going to work. Yeah. So, sweet.